not free, the whole thing collapses. Okay? So we make sure that all the components that we use in GNU Health are free and libre. So the main functionalities or the main areas of functionality of new health, we can summarize it in four of them, okay? The first one has to do with the community, with all the background that we have on that community. Those are the people, families, the socioeconomic conditions, the housing conditions, water, etc. Health professionals, everybody that lives in that specific area, the demographics in general. We are talking about people, we are not talking about patients at this moment, okay? One of our main goals here is dealing with people before patients. If we have patients, then we have made something wrong along the way that had that person or that family or that community got sick. So we have to work a lot on primary care, on health promotion and disease prevention. Once we have covered that, we can go up and deal with genomics, genetics, and, and so on. But before, primary care is key on our project. The second area has to deal with doctor and patient relationships. That has to do with evaluation, genetics, medical history, and so on. The third one is, okay, so I have a health institution and we have to take care of it. That has to do with financials, that has to be with suppliers, that has to do with stock management, human resources, uh, pharmacies. That would be the uh, enterprise resource planning part, okay? All the transactional part. And finally, we make sense of all the data that we have been gathering in these three prior areas so the health ministry and the health authorities can actually optimize their health campaigns. So it would kind of go in a sequential way, from the person to the patient to the health institution to a more global um, health authorities and health ministries. These six projects or sub-projects are kind of what it makes the GNU Health ecosystem. So you have things dedicated to uh, hospital management, then you have things dedicated to embedded systems, like running it on a RASPI or other single board uh, platforms. Uh, you have LIMS, laboratory information systems. You have the GNU Health Federation that I will talk later on, which allows you to deploy large-scale public health networks across the country, and um, other areas like bioinformatics and clinical genetics and so on. Depending on the type of institutions that you have, you will use one, other, or both of them. As I said, this is, non, this is a non-technical talk, so I just put some snapshots here of, so you get an idea of what new health can do from, you know, the, uh, imaging, diagnostic imaging to reporting to the transactional things, appointments. Um, you can do things of uh, histology, uh, wristbands for the newborns, obstetrics, uh, gynecology, etc. So, but the reason I am here today is because I want to talk about human rights and how we as a free software community can actually do something about the human rights. And the reality is that we live in a very unjust world. That's the reality. And I think that we as a free, libre community has a lot to do with fixing or trying to fix this uh, unfairness that the politicians have given us. Worldwide, I'm talking here. So if we look at some of the WHO statements, the World Health Organization, one of them is no one should get sick and die just because they are poor. Okay, that's, that's very important. So no matter what is your socioeconomic status, you should be able to get the best health care possible no matter where you live, no matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are. 
And we have to have that present. And when we are coding, we have to come that sentence every single day. Because we'll see later that this is all about collective freedom. Freedom is important, but collective freedom is even more important. Uh, but yet, 20,000 kids die every single day in misery from social diseases. And what are the definitions of a social disease? Well, those that are made by humans, those are preventable diseases. So if we talk about human trafficking, we are talking about the social disease. If we talk about prostitution, we are talking about uh, social diseases. All of these are preventable. And they are not only happening in so-called developing countries. They are happening on our own backyards. The Mediterranean is becoming a massive graveyard. And look what Salvini is saying in Italy. So if we look at Ailan here, this little kid died on our Mediterranean Sea. But then we have this little baby girl that died with her father in Rio Grande, trying to cross to the United States. And that is happening because our politicians are making this possible. And when somebody like Open Arms try to get them, they are going to open a legal suit for those who are trying to rescue, which, by the way, is their moral duty to do. Not only moral, but legal duty to pick up anybody that is in the Mediterranean trying to get away from all the bravery, from being raped, from all the disasters that is happening in Libya today. That's just a single example of what's going on today. And all those 20,000 kids, that's a soccer stadium filled of dead children every single day. And we, as a libre community, as a free software community, has, have to do something about it. And this is why we are here today. Or at least this is why I am here today. And as I said, these people are victims of war. Probably one of the most ludicrous business today. They have to escape from their land, and then when they reach safe heaven, we kick them out. So the very first people or the very first politicians who are putting these people at war, who are impoverishing them, taking all the natural resources from their lands, forcing, forcing them to leave their countries, are the ones who are saying, no, you don't belong here, go back. And it's our responsibility to scream out that what they are doing is wrong because they are there because somebody voted. So something really has to be changed in that sense. And by the way, not only human beings are being destroyed here. Uh, now this thing is coming probably with more volume than before because of the climate change. But they are suffering a daily holocaust every single day. Too. And we have to do something about it. We think that we are very intelligent, but we are the most stupid species in the face of the earth. Human being, yeah. We might be very good at coding, but we are very, very stupid. So what's happening with healthcare? What well, is becoming or is becoming a business? Now, what used to be a person, it was to be a patient, now it's becoming a patient, it's becoming a client. And you are going to, depending on how much you pay to that company or to that insurance, you are going to have different levels of healthcare. And that is wrong. As a matter of fact, we are seeing a rise, right, on 
the public on the private health sector and a distraction on the public health sector. And hey, financial companies, those are banks, are taking over the insurances. And you know what the bank does when you don't have money, right? You are in trouble. Well, you just have to extrapolate that issue with the health now. If you don't have money, you won't have access to health. And we are talking here about universal health care, universal health coverage. The other things that are happening is we are seeing so much technology, so much sophistication in medicine that is shifting away the human factor. The old typical family doctor that we used to have is seldom found now. They just prescribe. They don't care about who are you, who are your family, how are you doing, no. They are just taking care of your sore throat. So there is nothing done in the terms of prevention or health promotion. Or health promotion. You are just doing something reactively. You are not healing, you are just curing something in a short term. This problem of privatization of healthcare is making silos. That means that every single healthcare institution has their own database, but they don't talk to each other. So if today I go to see this doctor in Thessaloniki because I had a sprain on my ankle and tomorrow I go to Athens, the person in Athens doesn't know that I had this sprain on my ankle. I have to start over my medical history. That's because they don't talk to each other. They are silos. They are obscure. And we have the technical means today to be able to have a unique patient ID per person, not only in your province or in your region, but worldwide. We should be able to move around the globe and everybody within the whole scope of the planet should be able to know what is my clinical history, provided that they have access to it, of course. And, you know, at the end what this happens is what happens with this scenario is that it doesn't allow transdisciplinary work among health professionals. And we have to break that. So, you know, our slogan is uh, freedom and equity in healthcare, and that's what we're trying to do for the last 10 years. And in some places we have achieved it, and we will keep on working on that. I see free software as an enzyme, as a catalyst, something that accelerates the time of a process. But free software by itself is nothing if I don't have the correct substrates. Free software needs social activism in order to activate itself. If I'm using free software just for my sake, we are not going to go much further because that's individual freedom. That's something that I'm taking from the community for myself. Now, if I take free software for the sake of my society, then we are talking about collective freedom. And that's the one we need to aim. That's the one we need to achieve. Okay? Collective freedom is what makes the difference in libre software. If I just take the talent and work of others for my own sake, that's being selfish. And that's what's happening a lot in many open source communities. We should get rid of open source and even free software. And we should just call it libre software, whether it's open source or whether it's free software. And that would make rid also of all the all discuss about free versus open source software. So what GNU Health Federation does is it's, it's, 
it's a community software done by the community and for the community. It's independent. It doesn't have any vendor logins. GNU Health cannot be bought. It's from GNU and it's from GNU Solidario. Those are NGOs. Nobody can buy it. It's not like IBM or Informix or anything like that in the past. It also tries to make a local, strong local community and a good ethical business model. Of course, you can have your own company selling services around GNU Health. And that's what actually you should do. Okay? But what you cannot do is locking people in once they buy your software, because this cannot be bought. The software is there, the code is there. You cannot have, as others have done, have this sort of uh, upgrade or migration path uh, obscure, so you cannot go from one version to another. All that bullcrap is out from uh, our project. We don't need that. We need to be transparent. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years since we exist. And this is one of the proposals we say. Hey, you know, the Free Software Foundation Europe says public money, public code. If I'm putting my money, my tax money into the government, why my government is putting the money on a private corporation? It doesn't make sense. It just does not make sense. And it does not make sense in public health. Because public health being ruled by a private com uh, corporation is a contradiction by itself. You cannot have a private corporation, you cannot have private software, closed software running public health. And that is what's happening today in Europe. And we have to change it. And one way of changing is telling your politicians, hey, you know, studies, what's, what's going on here? What's the, the, the software that you're going to use? Are you going to use free software in the public administration? Oh, yes, well, then you have my vote. But if you don't, you won't. And I will make sure that everybody knows that you will not use free software on the public administration. As a matter of fact, it should be a state law that said it, you know. Public administration should run free, libre software, period, end of the story. And then use whatever you want, as long as it's free. Of course, I mean, one of the other things that we run into health informatics, it's privacy. We don't know because closed softwares are black boxes. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You don't know what's going on with your data at the moment that, they, that the doctor or the health professional hits enter. Is it going to an insurance company? What's going on with my data? I don't know because the software is encrypted. I don't know what's going on there. Now, if it's free software, I have the knowledge of every single line of code that is running that system. And that's a huge plus. And we cannot fall into the easiness of whatever company gives you this for free. Because that's gratis. And that's the main difference between libre and gratis. And that's what they are doing in Africa. They are giving you something gratis today, but you know that sooner than later they are going to charge you twice what they gave you gratis today. So we have to change that. And that's why free software it and offers a tremendous advantage for not only developing countries, for the whole humanity at large to be used in the public health arena, specifically in public administration in general. Now, at the end of the day, what you have here is a federation network of many multiple health institutions across your country that no matter where you go in Spain, your health information is going to be updated in a very single second that they hit enter. And they, yet, because it's a federation, 
they remain independent of each other. Okay, so this guy here can deal with their financial resources, with their human resources independently, but yet every single health record that has been taken there is going to be aggregated into a health information system nationwide within this federation. Now, we talk about a bit of primary care, but we also have state-of-the-art technology in clinical genetics and cancer research, for example. Now, if you are a research institution, now you build a perfect bridge between the clinician that is every day seeing people there and the research institution on the other part. And now we can say, hey, what is the natural variant of this gene that has changed and I don't know yet what is the clinical significance of it? And the only way of knowing it, because we have thousands of natural variants that we don't know what is the clinical significance of it, is because of aggregating data. Now we are not just talking about we are not just talking about the molecular basis of the disease. Now we are talking about the lifestyle and other factors that will make that gene to express or not. And that's what makes the whole picture exciting. And that's what we should aim at. Being able to have something that we know, that we can uh, customize for ourselves and for our needs, and be able to share information, to collaborate, because we are living today in a world of competition, and we have to get rid of the competition part, and we have to get into the collaboration part. Okay, that's what makes a difference in Libre Software. We don't compete to each other. KDE does not compete with Genome. On the contrary, now they are working more and more together. And that's the beauty of free libre software. We are here to make humanity better. And of course we enjoy coding, but when we code and we make a meaning out of that coding, it gets even better. And of course we have our own public servers where you can just go there and test it and run it and put your code and your reports and put your new nodes into the federation and play around with it before you go live on your center and so on. It's quite complex in terms of all these sub-projects, but at the end it makes it very simple. That's what we try to make simple. Finally, I will just go through some examples of projects around the world. We got from clinics, small clinics in the Cameroon rainforest in Africa and also in uh, Latin America, many primary care centers, many. Uh, and we also are in the largest hospital in Asia. That's uh, New Delhi in, in, in India. So, uh, you know, the size does not matter at the end of the day. Um, what is important is that we provide freedom and equity to everybody, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what is your social economic conditions. And we also work in some projects with the World Health Organization. In this case, uh, this is a Bafia in a district hospital in Cameroon. We train the guys from WHO uh, so they can actually do local capacity. That's the other key here that we talked a bit before. We don't, go, we don't want to go to Cameroon, we don't want to go to Argentina, we don't go to, want to go to Germany teach and go back and leave the team there. That's not the key. We have to make sure that we make enough planning so we make capacity building. Those guys that stay there are the ones who have to carry on the project. 
Because if we don't do that, the project is not sustainable. And sooner than later, it will collapse. We have projects in Laos for many years already. And they are working. Why? Because they made sure that they had capacity planning. They have local people doing the work. And that's what we have to achieve with this. United Nations University has also adopted uh, GNU Health. The whole Jamaica government, this is the whole government, this is what we, we wish to have in every country across the world, that they take this, that the Ministry of Health takes GNU Health to take care of the health promotion and disease prevention of their people as they have done in Jamaica. And this is from 2012. And different governments have been there and the project's still running. Red Cross. Now, you don't have an excuse now. You're next. <laughs> uh, and that's Mexico. Um, and they have around uh, 300,000 evaluation per year is not huge as in the case of uh, AIMS, but 300,000 people per year is it's an amount. Okay, so, you know, it's nice to see multilateral organizations like WHO or, or big organizations like Red Cross across the world taking free software as the philosophy of you know, providing health care for their people. Laos, um, one interesting story. Laos, the first project we did there was for the Center of Medical Rehabilitation. Laos is the most densely bombed country in the world. When the Vietnam War happened, the U.S. bombed all the area across Vietnam and Laos with uh, UXOs, unexploded ordnance. Okay, so those are these landmines that if you walk and you step into it, chances are you are going to get killed, and if you are not dead, you are going to lose your limbs. Okay, so what the uh, Center of Medical Rehab does is they do prothesis, they operate, they do all the orthopedics, so these people can actually get reinserted in the societies, okay? And they've been using GNU Health since uh, 2015, I think, okay? And um, it's, uh, we, are, we are humbled and we are very proud to see this type of organization again. They, they actually did a new package uh, on top of GNU Health for orthopedics. And that package is now being used across the globe. So this is important too. So it's not just that we provide this software, but we also make the software better with every single implementation that we do across the globe. And what we learn from Laos now is being used in Argentina, in Jamaica, in Germany, or wherever you are in the world, and vice versa. Academic, so if the Red Cross does have not an excuse now, uh, the University of Macedonia does not have an excuse either now, uh, to join the New Health Alliance of Academic and Research Institutions. We do this as we have done with different uh, institutions across the world, um, because first of all, they have the state of the art. They know what's going on. They, they have the latest technology and the brilliant people that is willing to work in this sort of projects. Um, as a matter of fact, if we concentrate in the University of, or National University of Entre Rios, they have done many projects across South America, and now they are going to do six projects in, uh, in Africa, in the west coast of, of Africa. So, and then they do interchange, you know, exchange of students from one university in the world to the other. They teach GNU Health in their classes and it is really nice and, and, and exciting seeing how uh, over the years this thing has evolved. 
Finally, let me invite you to uh, our uh, GNU Health Con. This time we are doing it with our friends from Orthanx. Orthanx is a DICOM uh, or a PAX server uh, for uh, imaging. And of course, we have our international workshop in eHealth in emerging economies. That is always the first day, because at the end of the day, we are all about social medicine. And once we have social medic medicine in place, we can actually uh, evolve. And that's what we've been doing for, for these years. This is happening December 13th to the 15th in Liege, in uh, uh, Belgium. And uh, I would love to have you, have you around. The guys from OpenSUSE will be again there, and that makes me very happy. Join us. Um, that's our uh, website. We are on Twitter. We are not on Facebook. Um, and that's our email. And we'll be very happy to see how we can work in Greece. We need to do more projects in the U European community. It's key that some governments in the European community embraces free software. Not only in healthcare, but public administration in general. Now, that makes a huge difference. So again, politician that is going to be shaking hands with people that takes the people as clients and not person, we don't want those politicians. We want people, of course, those people that are putting in jail people from open arms or whatever, from rescuing migrants that are, you know, uh, fighting for their lives in the Mediterranean, we don't want those politicians. This is all about human rights, and this is how we fight for our rights in public health care. And finally, this is our very first project. As I said, we started doing education. 2006, um, Santiago del Estero in the uh, north of Argentina, uh, rural area school, when we went there, put some uh, computers with GNU Linux, we noticed that these kids needed something else that technology. Technology was good for them, but they needed um, shoes to go to school. And that's what ring the bell and say, hey, you know, well, you know medicine, you know computer science, why don't we do something for the rural areas, health professionals, and help them out on dealing with their communities and these kids and so on. Well, now these kids are ladies and gentlemen now because grown up already, and, uh, and that was what kicked off the GNU Health project. But still, you know, the very same idea of health must remain a non-negotiable human right remains. And that's what we are all about. And I hope that you join us in our fight for our rights in public health. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Is it on now? Excellent. So thank you very much again. That was absolutely fanta um, fascinating. I guess, does anybody have any questions? I'm seeing a couple there, so I'll grab one there and then one of them. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Um, I have a question, it has a couple of parts to it. Uh, so. My question is, with traditional open source applications, a lot of times with um, client-side software, the people that are coding it, the people that are actually developing it, are the ones that are benefiting. They're using it, the writing software that they personally have a stake in, that they're using. Um, doctors, generally speaking, medical doctors and medical professionals aren't uh, software developers. They don't really write client-side software. Where does the manpower come from to sustain a software package that is equal in features, stability, the works to the proprietary counterparts when the proprietary counterparts in medicine are notoriously, ridiculously expensive, just like in science. Um, it's not like 
if it, the, the, the people that would be coding it aren't medical doctors, so number one, they don't necessarily know what features doctors want. That's not an obvious thing. And number two is they're not using it themselves. So that's, I could see that as being really a buggy experience. So that's my question. Yeah. Well, in my case, I'm a medical doctor. So somehow I could see what was needed on my daily practices, it put in what makes sense, what it doesn't make sense, what it makes it over bloated. Um, we try to use standards, you know, like ICD-10 or ICPM or um, SNOMED, whatever makes it possible to link for whatever, you know, health regulations that you have in that country. Now, you have a very good point there in terms of, for example, the United States. It's out of my reach because I'm not going to put a single cent of my money to get new health certified by Kiba. If someone wants to do it, perfect. It's their job. But there is a fundamental issue before even that, is that they have to change the government before they can embrace free software in healthcare in the United States. Um, and of course, there is a lot of FUD, right? There is a lot of fat in, in this by the big corporals saying, hey, you know, oh, you're going to be using something that is free software, but it's not certified and blah, blah, blah. Um, that's up to them, it's not up to me, you know. Um, there are a lot of medical doctors and um, bioinformaticians um, you know, PhD guys that really knows about genetics and we think new health. Um, so I wouldn't really worry much about the quality at the end of the day because it's something that evolves and you know that in free software the good thing is if something is wrong everybody's going to see it and chances are it will get fixed. Um, again, countries already for many years have been using it. Uh, but we need more. And one of the things is we have to get rid of the idea of, oh, but free software in healthcare or public administration is for developing countries? That's not true. That's not true. In genetics, probably we are above average of many other software that is around there. Now, one thing is with the only thing that we need are governments, politicians to embrace, not just GNU Health, free software in healthcare. Whether it's you know, health, what is or thanks for imaging, whatever. That's fine. This is not an issue of which project you take. I don't care. As long as it's free, it's libre, go for it. You know, so, but that takes legislation, that takes people that make laws to change the current ideas and the, all these um, stones that they put you up front so you cannot actually make it um, and that is not up to me. So what we do at this point is saying, I usually said the south teaches the north because it's in the south countries, southern countries, the ones who are actually adopting it, probably because of a real need because they don't have the money to use another one, but once they use it and they see that it's, it, it's doing their job, then we can show it to the north and say, hey, why don't we go this way? It's a matter of freedom. It's not a matter of, you know, legislation. Some questions? On... Yeah. Hello. So you mentioned you want to have a universal ID for every patient, right? Um, but don't you think that could be a big problem from a security perspective? Because if I have one single ID and I can retrieve the entire um, medical history, that's great for a doctor, but that is incredibly uh, problematic if I am an attacker and I'm in that federated network, um, or if I am a rook doctor of some sort um, who, who, who does something nasty, like you, you mentioned a couple of disease, uh, social diseases, I mean, there are doctors who, who, who then run a prostitution ring or whatever. Um, and especially in, in, in countries, like you mentioned, there's also a lot of corruption going on. So 
it's not always clear where to, to have the boundary. Um, how, how, how would you solve such a problem? And a universal, like if you have a single idea, ID, you cannot exchange that. If you have something you, you can replace, then that's easier. Like if, if I can issue you a new ID and then associate that with your, with your record, that's maybe easier. But like a single number shows that, especially in the United States, you have the social security number. It doesn't really work in the age of um, the internet with connected uh, devices and connected services and stuff. Well, corruption. Corruption is uh, it's, it's inherent to, you know, to human being. It's not inherent to a specific country. Probably the most democratic country are the most corrupt in the world. Um, and we see the leaders that we have today, right? Um, GNU Health uses digital signatures. It uses encryption. You can encrypt at record level. You can encrypt at uh, field level. Um, but at the end of the day, yes, you're right. Somebody has, at some moment in time, has to be able to read what's within that person or patient to make her or his life better. And depends on that person and the oath he did at the moment that he graduated from medicine or from whatever health profession that he did. And that's something that is not up to me. As a matter of fact, most of those issues that you are talking about now, uh, very important issues, by the way, uh, are dependent on, well, now we have the GDPR, you know, in Europe, and, and many things are on an upper layer, you know, that sometimes you say, well, if you want to have this, you have to conform this type of legislation. Um, not that far away, a nurse was found to have a pile of clinical records, handwritten clinical records at her house. And she was selling that to the insurance companies. Of course, if you have access to a database, instead of having a pile of 100 or 200 clinical records, you are going to have 100,000 clinical records. But at the end of the day, it comes again of we have to make sure that we have people that obey and put enough security means as encryption and, and whatever it takes to minimize. You are not going to get rid of corruption because that's inherent to our being of being a person, a human being. So if our politicians and presidents are corrupt, imagine that anything below that might be corrupt too, but that's again something that is not up to me. Um, and I think that at the end, if we put it into a balance, um, the benefits outweighs the risk. But yes, of course, I mean, the risk is going to be there always. And again, somebody is going, by the way, WHO is also thinking about this universal ID. It's, it's not just something that comes from, from our thoughts. Uh, and. Also, there is a, a problem with that inherent, it's human rights. You know, um, you, in some countries around the world, being gay is going to be an issue. And they might kill you, and if they get your sexual preference within that, you might get into trouble. But, it, again, outweighs, you know, the benefits there is. It's something that, Probably at the moment of implementing it, you might see what can be done or what cannot. But having the possibility of saying you are allergic to penicillin and you are, you know, flying to whatever place, and that health professional knowing it before prescription is very important because it might save your life. So um, it seems to me that if you work in the medical profession, uh, it, it's a mistake can have deadly consequences. And, and it, it seems to me that the same is, applies if you develop software that's used in the medical profession. But you're a medical doctor, you have a strict code of ethics, and, and 
in, in most countries, uh, you need a license to practice medicine. For a software developer, we have, we have no universal code of ethics and we don't need to be licensed to practice. Um, do you see this as a problem or is it the case that everywhere the doctors uh, you know, still have the final word or the, you know, the, the let's say that the, um, the doctors have the final responsibility do you, or do you see this as a problem that there's no universal code of ethics in the software profession? Um, no, I, I think that I don't think that the doctor should have the last word here. I think this is a this is a teamwork. This is collaboration among uh, you know computer scientists, among psychologists, among nurses, among doctors, um, genetics. You know there are so many different areas, and we need them all. And there is not one more important than the other one. Um, you know, morality, it depends on, you know, it it's, depends on the country, depends on the culture. You know, it's something that we, what is, might be right here, it might be wrong on the other way. But again, that's why you have legislations in every single country. And that legislation should guide how you customize Genu Health to run in that specific country. The same way that you install uh, you know, the Lao uh, language, or the Thai, or the Spanish, or German. You do the same in terms of financial, and you do the same in terms of who can do what, and what is the level of access, where you are a nurse, where you are a doctor, where you are a psychologist. Um, and that's something that deals with the current legislation on that specific country. You, you provide, Genu Health is pretty much a framework of you know, that can be customized for, for whatever country you are in. But, uh, you know, if, if whoever is coding that uh, does something that applies and conforms the current legislation, they might as well take it. I don't know whether I answered your question, but uh, we have something that is called a social contract in New Health that pretty much goes into that, and whoever wants to be part of the GNU Health Network has to sign these social contracts, uh, where you take people before patients and all the stuff that we've been talking today here. And yes, you have the signature of that person, but you never know what's going to happen afterwards. If you want to put that specific code within the general package, then it will go through different stages, uh, and if it passes it, then it can be part of the new health project. Yeah. Dr. Falcon, thank you very much for your presentation. And I, I'm also glad that I have the opportunity to make your question after the previous question, because they set the tone uh, right for this. I'm a fellow medical doctor myself, and uh, according to the first question was about who, who, co who makes the software, is not who uses the software. But there is actually a rising number of young uh, practitioners who code, who can code. Just the other day at the hospital, I, I started a conversation with a, a colleague and he knew C and suddenly after five minutes of talking about the disease, we are talking about printf and assembly. So, uh, yes, th there's a rising opportunity uh, for, for, soft, for free software because the, the doctors are getting more conscious about this. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to learn about new health in the university. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad I, I learned about it here. Do you think that, um, going for the question, it should be, even if not a mandatory, uh, but a promoted, uh, an optional part of the medical um, learning uh, programming skills? Do you think it's important, for instance, so that we can have the last word, or at least uh, 
some pets is getting a review of a medical doctor who is bound by, by our ethics. Do you think it, it's important that we, as doctors, acquire technical skills in programming? Well, dear colleague, I think that it is mandatory not to give us at school Microsoft Access or Excel as health informatics. That is not health informatics. That is bullcrap. And if you want to know about epidemiology, if you want to know about digital signatures, you have to teach them about epidemiology, health informatics, and digital signatures. Now, teaching the people about PowerPoint, Excel, and Access, it's a sin. Uh, and that's what's happening in many universities today. Fortunately, though, many others are allowing you, for example, to use R in epidemiology. No, listen, I, I don't want to use Stata. Can I use R? Yes, sure, go for it. Beautiful. Give me the choice. If at the end I produce the same result, give me the choice. Um, I think that doctors and health professionals in general have no knowledge about uh, digital they might be end users but they don't really know what they are doing you know it's good they know about public crypto uh, things that are embedded on our public day you know on our daily lives um, and yes of course it would be great if they can teach as they are doing in, in the national university of, of argentina uh, new health or whatever other uh, free software, their students. So when they come out of the university, not only they, they are competent in the technical areas, but the philosophy. You know, here we're talking about the philosophy of libre software, which is most important. At the end, you know, uh, the technical part, you can learn it, but it's more important to get out of there being morally right, and that's what we try to do. And I, I fully agree with you that we should have more health informatics, but talk the right way, not with access or whatever um, malevolous stuff. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned certification uh, before, which is uh, uh, required to deploy soft, uh, medical software in several countries. Uh, do you think it would be possible to get that certifications for GNU Health? And uh, if so, what would be uh, the cost? Well, no, what, what I was talking about certification was more, you know, like at national level, like in the US, you need to be HIPAA compliant and this yeah. type of things. Um, I, I don't really know the cost for the US on how much that would be to put but it's going to be a lot of money and I'd rather put that money, first of all, I don't have it, <laughs> which is a big plus already, <laughs> so we are in trouble there. But even if I had the money, if the, the GNU Solidario had the money, I wouldn't put a single cent there. That has to come from them. If they want to put it, great. Find somebody to, to use it because I think that they are using these financial burdens to make a barrier to who actually can certificate their software and who cannot actually be because it's out of our financial or economic uh, possibilities. Um, for using GNU Health in whatever country, you don't need a certification from us. This is libre software. You can put it, you can use it. Then if your country uses specific legislation, it's something that you have to customize it for them. We just deliver a framework. I don't know whether that answer your question or uh, well it was more like if is there a, a specific requirement in these certifications that ex excludes libre software or free software or could you just go and say yeah i have all that certifications one day and so i deploy my software on the us or european market uh, or i don't really think that it depends whether the software is libre or closed I think it just depends on a lot of administrative bureaucratic stuff that you have to go through. 
but to be honest, uh, that's something that the U.S. or, you know, whatever country wants to do it and whoever is inside. I know people in the U.S. that are using it, uh, uh, but on their private uh, usage, not in the public health arena. That's, that's what I think makes the huge difference if you want to do something about public health in the U.S. But again, that's, that's the U.S. and that's their own uh, issues. I think we're pretty much out of time. Okay, uh, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, now, but um, just to let you know that tonight at seven o'clock we have our gala dinner here at the, um, at the venue as well. And I'm sure everyone would, would be delightful to come along, so please come along and say hi. And also a huge thank you uh, to Dr. Louis Francom. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, guys. Thank you.